Introduction to Water-Soluble Polymers, Section 3, Molecular Weight Measurements. As you've probably heard me mention at least a couple of times now, the molecular weight is one of the most important parameters to understand when discussing polymers. In this section, we will go over how polymer samples can be analyzed for their molecular weight. We will focus on the most common two methods, shown here in blue, and briefly discuss the last method, which is used more for the analysis of natural polymers, particularly proteins, than for synthetic polymers. The most predominant method for determining a polymer's molecular weight for research purposes is size exclusion chromatography. Some researchers refer to this method as gel permeation chromatography. The two names mean the same thing. It's just that different fields use different verbiage. As any chromatography method requires, SEC also makes use of a mobile phase and a stationary phase. For SEC, the eluent, the mobile phase, is pumped through a column, the stationary phase, and then a detector picks up what any analyte has exited the column. The pump is always some sort of a high pressure pump, because it is difficult to push the eluent through these SEC columns. The detectors used can vary, but most are simple refractory index or UV absorbance detectors. Eluent is chosen depending on the polymer sample. Clearly, you would want a good solvent for the polymer in question. The column is composed of packed particles. In reality, they are packed even closer than how I have them shown here. The particles are oftentimes held in place via a frit on the end to keep them from exiting the column, and or some cross-linking to each other, creating a gel. The gel produced kind of behaves like yogurt. I've had an opportunity to open a column once. Uh, the term gel permeation chromatography comes from this gel of packed particles. Now, the most important thing to understand about these particles is that they are porous. The pores range from 10 to 10,000 angstroms, depending on the column. These pores are used to fractionate the polymer sample as it moves through the column. Before I move on, I want to stress the point that this entire setup does not fractionate the polymer molecules out like a filter or a sieve. Instead, Excluded volume is the principle which allows for an SEC or GPC column to fractionate a polymer sample. How? The key is all in the little pores on the particles. Remember how a, a polymer behaves like a coil in solution? Depending on its molecular weight, it has a particular size. So if we take a sphere and roll it across this idealized particle surface, we watch the path that its center of mass takes. Now, this is not necessarily the exact journey that a polymer would coil would take as it moves through the column, but the dotted red line does show the boundary of the volume available to the red sphere. The volume represented by the shaded red area is the volume which the red sphere must traverse in order to get through the column. We can do the same thing for a smaller sized sphere. Here, the blue line represents the path which the blue sphere's center of mass takes as it rolls across the surface. Again, it is just the boundary, not the actual path it must take as it moves through the column. However, you can notice that because the blue sphere has a smaller radius than the red sphere did, its center of mass can get closer to the edges of the particle. Now, as you can imagine, the volume which is available to the blue sphere is slightly larger than the volume available to the red sphere. In order for the blue sphere to exit the column, it must traverse this larger volume and hence it takes longer for the smaller blue sphere to make its way through the column than the larger red sphere. This is counterintuitive before you understand the concept of excluded volume, but you should be able to see now how larger polymer molecules will move through a column faster than smaller polymer molecules. Let's put a polymer sample at the start of the column and bring back all the components of an SEC system and see how this plays out. For the time being, our hypothetical polymer sample is composed of just two different molecule sizes. We'll need an appropriate solvent for our polymer sample, called the eluent in a system like this, and a high pressure pump to move the eluent and our polymer through the column. On the other side of the column, we'll need a detector capable of noticing when a polymer molecule passes by. This is typically a refractive index detector, or RI detector for short. Now, our detector just stays on the whole time, waiting for something to pass by. We will plot the detector response versus the volume of eluent that has been pumped through here. Knowing the pump speed 
allows this x-axis to be converted into time, referred to as either elution time or retention time. So now as we start pumping eluent through, we see the polymer sample begin to move through the column. Since the larger red molecules have a smaller volume available to them, they start winning the race through the column. The smaller blue molecules take their time getting through the packed particles, but eventually do come out. The detector did its job and picked up concentrations of both molecules, plotted here. Now, if these were standards, we can calibrate our system so that the volume of eluent, or retention time, can be converted to molecular weights. Typically, more than just two standards are used, but the principle is the same. Once the x-axis of our plot has been calibrated, we can run other samples of unknown molecular weights and get an entire molecular weight distribution. Again, higher molecular weight polymers will come out of the column sooner than lower molecular weights. In order to wrap up this overview of size exclusion chromatography, I should mention a few details. First, the eluent used for most synthetic polymers is fairly simple. In most cases, toluene or some other solvent is used. However, in this course, we focus on water-soluble polymers and natural polymers. This means we have to consider more things when it comes to choosing an SEC eluent. If you remember from the last lecture, polyelectrolyte coils can change with pH and ionic strength. Since SEC really only cares about the hydrodynamic volume of the polymer coils in solution, the eluent becomes very important. Again, as the pH of the surrounding solution, the eluent in this case, is raised, any weak acid functional groups on the MERS become deprotonated and therefore ionized. This causes swelling of the random coil, and thus an increase in the hydrodynamic volume of the polymer molecules as they are forced through the column. Adding sodium chloride, or any other salt for that matter, helps to screen out those electrostatic interactions between the MERS on the polymer chain. As you can imagine, this decreases the amount of swelling that the coil undergoes, and the hydrodynamic volume begins to decrease. Eventually, as the ionic strength of the eluent becomes high enough, the hydrodynamic volume shrinks back down as the coulombic interactions are all but completely screened out. Because this range of hydrodynamic volumes can be accessed all for a single molecular weight molecule, aqueous SEC can be a bit more challenging. When I was running an SEC system during my graduate school days, I used two tricks. First, I used the common trend of buffering the aqueous solution to a precise pH and controlling the ionic strength. Now that worked great, except I still had to recalibrate the system every time I changed the eluent. So I started making really large batches of eluent, typically like 4 liters at a time. Not much of a trick per se, but it saved me a lot of extra time. Here are some results for a little study I did to show these pH and salt effects on SEC retention times. I used two different sodium polyacrylate samples. Uh, in green is the 3000 Dalton sample, and in blue is the 115 Dalton sample. In general, you can see that the larger blue samples went through the column faster than the green samples. That makes sense. Now, as the ionic strength of the eluent was changed from low to medium and even to relatively high levels, you can see that the retention times increased. What does that mean? It shows that as the salt concentration increases, the retention time increases. Again, the retention time is a measure of how large the random coil is, or the hydrodynamic volume to be more precise. This data not only supports the effects of pH and ionic strengths like we just discussed, but it also shows how drastic the effect, these effects can be. In this case, an uncontrolled eluent composition would pretty much render any molecular weight result useless. That was why I was so careful with my eluent batches. This is common for aqueous SEC systems. Accurate results require a controlled eluent. As you have probably picked up on by now, calibration of the entire SEC system, even including the eluent, is paramount to accurate and useful molecular weight results. How is this done? First off, you need to run standards through the column and record their respective elution times or retention times. I have an example set plotted here. You should notice that there is not a linear trend here. It's fairly obvious. 
If you plot the y-axis on a logarithmic scale, however, the data quickly linearizes. Thus, the following equation is used when calibrating known molecular weight standards to SEC elution times. Linear regression can be used to find the two parameters, a and b, in the equation. Now, an elution time for an unknown sample can be converted to a molecular weight. Or, a more useful option is that all of the elution times for a recorded sample can be converted into their respective molecular weights, and a molecular weight distribution can be plotted. Now that's nice. Once your SEC system has been calibrated, unknown samples can be analyzed, but care must be taken to calculate molecular weight averages. Knowing how the system detects polymers is vital. In our example, the most common detector was used, an RI detector. Essentially, it measures the concentration of the MERS in the effluent stream. In case you're wondering, the effluent is simply the eluent and the sample after they've exited the column. This is what the detector is constantly analyzing. In the case of our refractive index detector, it's counting the MERS as they pass by, not the polymer molecules. Since the molecular weight average equations, as shown here, are always given in terms of polymer molecules, and not the mass of MERS, we need to convert them. Here, on the right, I have the converted formulas for you to use when the detector response is via the mass of polymer rather than the number of polymers. The key to this conversion is pretty simple. The detector response, H sub i, is essentially the mass of the polymer at m sub i, and it's just equal to the number of molecules x sub i times the molecular weight m sub i. You'll notice that h sub i plays the same role as y sub i, the mass fraction. That is because it is essentially the same thing. The only difference is that h sub i is typically received from the detector as a voltage signal. Thus its units are millivolts, but no one cares about that anyways, because the h sub i units cancel out in the formulas anyway. So that's nice. Before we discuss viscosity molecular weight measurements, we should probably go over viscosity in general. What is viscosity? Sometimes it's easier to understand an example. Honey, as compared to water, is much thicker, right? It takes a long time to pour honey, and oftentimes you need a larger hole to get any honey to move through it. This is because of its viscosity. A high viscosity liquid is what we oftentimes refer to as a thick liquid. Technically, it's defined as the liquid's resistance to lamellar flow. It has the units of pascal seconds, or centipoise. The older, more conventional units of centipoise are still used today, but I like to use pascal seconds when teaching the concept, because then the units help with the definition. So the setup for the definition looks like this. We have a liquid between two plates, a top and bottom surface. I have the liquid in between shown at the molecular level. Now, if a shear stress is applied to the top surface relative to the bottom surface, the liquid molecules slide past each other incrementally like this. This is referred to as lamellar flow. Keep in mind that in most cases, this behavior goes unnoticed, because the top surface is not a hard surface, but rather the molecules moving at the bulk flow rate. Take the example of a garden hose. As the water moves through the hose, the molecules right next to the walls don't really move. But the molecules next to those molecules move past each other, and so on until the bulk is reached. Then all of the molecules move at the same rate in the bulk. The velocity of any molecules is given the value u. And as you can imagine, the flow velocity is dependent upon how far away the molecules are from the wall, y. Because the molecules slide past each other in such a consistent pattern, we actually have a linear relationship between u and y, as described by Newton. The relation between the shear stress, tau, and the flow gradient is defined as the viscosity. It is given the Greek variable eta, which kind of looks like our English n, but with a longer right leg. Anyway, the units work like this. A shear stress of 1 pascal is required for a full one second to move the top surface, or the, the bulk, located a distance y from the bottom surface, that same distance off to the side as shown.
Now, polymers all do the same thing to a liquid's viscosity when they are dissolved in it. They increase it. The question is to what extent. Actually, the molecular weight of the polymer is one of the factors influencing the extent of their influence on the viscosity. Because of this, viscosity can be used to determine polymer molecular weights. A YouTube apparatus can be used to do this. No, not a YouTube like YouTube videos on the internet. YouTube as in a glass tube that is shaped like a big letter U. I'll show you how it works in just a little bit. Before we go over how the actual measurement works, we need to see how a capillary tube isolates the shearing effect. Shown here are the two walls of a capillary tube. The liquid molecules flow down through the tube like this. You can see how a bulk flow region is never realized, since the tube is so small. You still get that lamellar flow gradient, though. With the radius of the capillary tube, R, and the length, L, we can see how Poisy's equation can be used to describe this flow through the capillary tube. It's tough to measure the flow rate as defined here, though, so we'll just apply some mathematical trickery to convert the equation by taking the equation for the volume of a cylinder and apply it to the liquid inside the capillary tube, we can convert dL into dV, which is nice, because now we can recast Poisy's equation above into a form that describes the volumetric flow rate as a function of the viscosity. So now let's use it. This volumetric flow rate can be measured with the help of a calibrated U-tube as shown here. The two portions of the glassware that are precisely calibrated are the capillary tube, both its length and its radius r, along with the volume of the smaller reservoir, the one on top of the capillary tube. The larger reservoir is just used to house the extra liquid, but it is not the part that we are interested in at the moment. Note that there are two lines etched into the glass to denote where the top and bottom of the smaller reservoir are calibrated to. I have them drawn as red lines here. So to begin, we start by filling our U-tube with solvent like this. Notice that the liquid level on the right is at the same height as on the left. Then, we use a pipette bulb to pull the liquid up until the small reservoir on top is more than full of liquid. Yes, filling past the top line is important. <laughs> then we get our stopwatch ready. Are you ready? Because in a real life experiment, the next part can happen quickly. We are going to remove the pipette bulb, and there will be a pressure difference between the two liquid levels due to their height difference. When you remove the pipette bulb, the liquid tries to balance out its levels between the two sides of the U-tube. In order to do this, the liquid level on the right must drop, and therefore must flow through the capillary tube. Once the level drops to the topmost calibration line, as shown here, you have to start your timer. The liquid keeps dropping through the capillary tube. When the liquid level reaches the lower calibration line, you have to stop your timer because the known volume, V, has now passed through the capillary tube. Of course, the liquid doesn't stop dropping until the levels are at the same height, but you already have the information you were after, the time on your stopwatch. This time, T, required for the volume, V, to pass through the capillary tube is proportional to the viscosity, eta, over the density, rho. At the moment, all we really care about is that it is proportional. How the time figures in with the rest of the variables from Poisy's equation is shown here, but just for your reference. I should mention that this eta over rho parameter is actually pretty important. It's important enough to get its own name. It's known as the kinematic viscosity. It is related to the time, t, by a single constant, a, known as the constant of proportionality. This constant of proportionality is unique to the U-tube being used, and is not dependent on the liquid at all. To be really honest with you, most U-tubes don't actually have known capillary tube radii and lengths and reservoir volumes. They just come with a calibrated and documented constant of proportionality, A. No one really cares about the other parameters. Now, just to clarify, this does not mean that all liquids will give the same times, T, for a given apparatus. It means that the time measured for various liquids will all have the same proportion to their respective kinematic viscosities. But so far, we haven't tested any polymers yet. All we have is a single time, T, for our solvent. We should probably move on and get some real work done, right?
we start out by taking the time required for the pure solvent to pass through the capillary tube and giving it the special designation T sub naught. Likewise, the pure solvent's viscosity we call eta sub naught, and its density we call rho sub naught. Then, we swap out the liquid in our U-tube for a dilute polymer solution. I emphasize the dilute portion of that for two reasons. For starters, no one wants to wait around for a solution as viscous as honey to go through the capillary tube. So make that solution dilute, okay? <laughs> but still, keep track of the concentration, because that will be important later. As for the second reason, we will see it in just a bit. Okay, so then you go through the same process of sucking up the liquid past the top calibration line and letting it drop down to the lower line while you time it. This new time will be longer than the pure solvent's T sub naught, because polymers always increase the viscosity of a solution. Again, we end up with a kinematic viscosity once we use the proportionality constant A. In this case, it is for the dilute polymer solution at the concentration C. Now it's time to define another viscosity parameter, the relative viscosity, denoted as eta sub rel for relative. It's defined as the polymer solution's viscosity relative to the viscosity of the pure solvent, hence its name. Since it is the ratio of two viscosities, it is unitless, which is nice. Also, since we used a dilute solution, we can make a very reasonable assumption. We assume that the density of the polymer solution, rho, is really close to the density of the pure solvent, rho sub naught. This allows us to cancel out both the A and the rho terms in the relative viscosity definition, leaving us with only the time terms. Thus, we can reasonably state that the relative viscosity, eta sub rel, is not just the ratio of viscosities, but also the ratio of times for the polymer solution to the pure solvent. Hopefully, now you can see why we only care about the stopwatch values when running these experiments. And this is a good thing. Because typically, when you analyze a polymer sample, you do a series of concentrations. In each concentration, you do multiple stopwatch tests to get a nice low error average value. Now we need to analyze our results. In order to analyze our polymer sample, we will need to go over a few more viscosity variables, each with a slightly different definition. To begin with, let's review the ones we've seen so far. The solvent viscosity is A to sub naught and then the polymer solution viscosity at a specified concentration is denoted as simply eta. Then, the ratio between the solution viscosity and that of the pure solvent is the relative viscosity, eta sub rel, or eta rel. Okay, now let's start going over our data. If we plot out the relative viscosities for a polymer at different concentrations, while still fairly dilute, mind you, we get a nice nonlinear plot like this. Nonlinear data makes for a much more difficult analysis, so we need to linearize it. There are two ways to do this. The first method for linearizing the data uses another viscosity variable, the specific viscosity, eta sub sp. It is defined as the relative viscosity minus 1. Remember that the relative viscosity is a unitless ratio. In turn, the specific viscosity is also unitless. We then take the specific viscosity of the polymer at concentration C and divide by that concentration. This yields the reduced viscosity, eta sub red, for reduced. This is not to be confused with the eta sub rel, which is the relative viscosity from before. Why do we go through all of this hassle? Well, when we plot the reduced viscosity versus C, the concentration, we get a very linear plot. Nice! That's what we're going for. This is the Huggins method, and the plot, as shown here, is then referred to as the Huggins plot for that set of data. Fitting the data to a line gives us both the slope and the y-intercept. The intercept B is really all we are after here, because it is the reduced viscosity as the concentration goes to zero. This is referred to as the intrinsic viscosity and is denoted by an eta with brackets around it. Please note that this is not the reduced viscosity of the pure solvent. Rather, the intrinsic viscosity is a hypothetical value, 
We want to know the effects of the polymer on the viscosity. However, we don't want to report a value that is dependent on the concentration of the polymer. So we interpolate the data back to the zero concentration. This is why linearizing the data is so important, to remove the concentration dependency of the data. A Huggins plot is the first method. The second method for linearizing the relative viscosity data is to define our last variable, the inherent viscosity. This is given the term eta sub i and h for inherent, and is defined as the natural logarithm of the relative viscosity divided by the concentration c. Plotting this inherent viscosity yields another linear plot, albeit very different from the Huggins plot. The inherent viscosity versus C is referred to as the Kramer plot for the data. Again, fitting the data to a line and finding the y-intercept yields the intrinsic viscosity as we interpolate back to zero concentration. Now, either method is acceptable, but I like to use both methods and make sure they both give the same intrinsic viscosity value, or at least pretty close anyway. Having two methods is a nice double check to make sure you're doing your math correctly since then both lines should point to the same value, the intrinsic viscosity for zero concentration. Note that due to how both the reduced and the inherent viscosity values are defined, they both have units of inverse concentration. Thus the intrinsic viscosity also has units of inverse concentration. Because of their concentrations, it's typically reported in deciliters per gram. Now that we have an intrinsic viscosity for our polymer sample, we need to convert that into a molecular weight value to report. Before I explain how this is done, we should go over some of the theory behind it. We will stick to correlations mainly, because we don't need all of the details. For instance, we start by remembering that the radius of gyration, r sub g, is proportional to the square root of capital N, the number of carbon-carbon bonds along the polymer backbone. Yes, we had a full formula, but I don't care about anything besides this correlation at the moment. We note that the number of carbon-carbon bonds will be directly proportional to the molecular weight of the particular polymer molecule. Thus, the radius of gyration will be proportional to the square root of the molecular weight of the polymer molecule. Here, I have the square root expressed as a one-half exponent on the molecular weight. Besides r sub g, we can look at r sub v, which is the radius of the sphere composing of the entire random coil, the hydrodynamic volume. The exact relationship is simply the equation for the volume of a sphere, where the radius is cubed. Alongside the fact that r sub v will be directly proportional to r sub g, we find that the hydrodynamic volume, v sub h, will be proportional to r sub g cubed. Now we're starting to get somewhere, because we can substitute in for r sub g, and we find that the hydrodynamic volume of the random coil is proportional to m raised to the three halves. Let's table this correlation from the random flight model for now, and quickly move our attention to the work Einstein did on viscosity. Using the stereotypical method often employed by physicists of reducing everything to hypothetical idealized spheres, he showed that the specific viscosity of a fluid, composed of hard spheres in a liquid, will be 5 halves times phi, with phi being the volume fraction of the spheres, we can just use the polymer random coils instead. To calculate phi, we would have to multiply the number of spheres by their hydrodynamic volume, and then divide by the total volume of the solution, phi. How are we going to find the number of spheres? We just need to find the number of polymer molecules. For a monodispersed sample, we can just simply take the mass concentration, C, along with the molecular weight of the polymers, and convert like this. Now we can start substituting back into Einstein's equation above, and we see that there is a very specific correlation between the specific viscosity of the fluid with idealized hard sphere polymer random coils and the molecular weight of the polymer. You should recognize the specific viscosity over concentration here as the reduced viscosity as defined before. This is the smart way to look at it because our next step is to take the limit as C approaches zero. Sound familiar? It should. This is the same process we used to get the intrinsic viscosity via the Huggins plot a few slides back. Now, using the result from the random flight model, mainly the V sub H, is proportional to M raised to the 3 halves power, 
we see that the intrinsic viscosity is proportional to m raised to the one-half power. Since this equation is highly idealized, not to mention still in a qualitative state, it can be generalized a bit to yield the intrinsic viscosity of a polymer is equal to k times m raised to the power of a. This is commonly known as the mark howenck equation. The empirical constants a and k are used to define a system depending on the polymer, solvent, and temperature. The semi-empirical mark howenck equation is well accepted, and these constants are tabulated in various places. The A constant ranges from 1 half to 2, and is the term representing the shape of the polymer in solution. As we just saw from Einstein's hard spheres, an A value of 1 half is characteristic of a polymer in a pore solvent, where the polymer coil is very dense due to its lack of interest in the solvent. A theta solvent brings in an A value of 0 0.8, and good solvents are around 1. Lastly, polymers that are so extended that they behave more like a rod than a sphere bring the exponent of the Marconic equation up towards 2. Like I said in the previous slide, Marconic constants K and A have been tabulated for many polymer solvent systems. This allows you to convert intrinsic viscosity to what is referred to as the viscosity average molecular weight, M sub V, of the polymer. However, if you don't have K and A values, you can find your own from standards. You will need a series of standards for your polymer, and you will need to find the intrinsic viscosity for each standard using the procedure we just went over. Then you will need to fit your data to the mark howenck equation. The problem is that the equation is not a linear formula. Simply linearize the mark howenck equation and you're on your way. There are a few different ways to do this, but I'll just show you one for example. To start with, we transform the equation by taking the natural logarithm of both sides. If you remember your log and exponent rules, you'll quickly see why. Pulling the a exponent of m down to a regular coefficient of the ln of m is the final step. We see that our equation is now in a linear form. All we have to do is plot the natural logarithm of the intrinsic viscosity versus the natural logarithm of the molecular weight, and voila, we have a linear plot. Now you can fit the data to a line and find out the slope and intercept. The slope is simply a, but the y-intercept is the ln of k. Just take the exponential of the intercept to back out your k, and you're done. We're finding your mark howenck constants anyway. Clearly, your next step would be to analyze some unknown samples to find their molecular weight. After measuring the intrinsic viscosity, you'll just need to dump it into the mark howenck equation and solve for the molecular weight. Note that this molecular weight value is referred to as the viscosity averaged molecular weight, and it is denoted as m sub v. To conclude this viscosity section, I want to mention that although this seems like a whole lot of equations and math, it really isn't. After you've done a few measurements and a few calculations, you'll see that it is actually pretty simple. You'll just need to do the same math many times over. If you're smart, you can create a nice spreadsheet to do all the mundane calculations for you. That's thinking ahead. To wrap up the molecular weight and measurement techniques, I'd like to briefly explain how one of the most powerful methods works. MALDITOF. Firstly, let's go over the acronym. MALDITOF stands for Matrix Assisted Laser Desorption Ionization Time of Flight. Well, that sort of clears things up. <laughs> eh, it's not as difficult as it seems. We just have to break it apart piece by piece. Because of the way the English language is structured, the most important information is often at the end of an acronym. So let's start with time of flight. What does that mean? It's actually used in a number of mass spectroscopy techniques. Essentially, you put a charge on molecules, or fragments of molecules, so that when you fire a pulse of opposite charge, the molecules start moving due to electrostatic attraction. Now, since the same force is applied to every molecule, a single charge, the smaller molecules move faster than their larger counterparts. Thus, the smaller molecules will reach the detector before the larger ones. But for any size, the time required to reach the detector can be used to calculate the mass of the molecule. That's what time of flight refers to. Now let's tackle the MOLDI portion of the acronym. Clearly, we will need a laser. Every cool experiment needs a laser, right? <laughs> Not to mention, the L does stand for laser here. 
we will also need some sort of matrix to hold our polymer sample. Now the matrix here is going to be used to transfer the energy from the laser to the sample molecules. The whole point is to ionize our sample and desorb our polymer molecules to get them prepared for their time of flight journey to the detector. So we shoot the laser right at the polymer sample in the matrix. The matrix is evaporated, leaving charged polymer molecules behind. Next, we pulse our counter charge, and the ionized molecules begin their flight towards the detector. Again, the smaller molecules are accelerated quicker than the larger molecules, and the sample is fractionated nicely. The time required for each fraction to reach the detector is recorded and we're done. Typically, you'll do this multiple times for each sample, not just because it's fun, but also because it's necessary. The laser only energizes the portion of the matrix it is focused on, so you just move the laser around on your sample and keep shooting it. Each time you fire that laser, you get another set of data. By the end, you just add up all of your individual shots to get a final set of data points. Typically, the computer software running the equipment will convert the times of flight into masses for you. Well, isn't that nice? This is a typical plot of some Maldi-Toff data I had taken when I was working on polyacrylic acid. For the most part, this technique doesn't work very well with synthetic polymers, so the fact that we figured out how to get this acrylic polymer to fly was noteworthy. But I show you this so you can see how amazing the resolution is with the Maldi-Toff system. First off, you've probably noticed that this doesn't look like the molecular weight distributions you've seen from SEC. Instead, it looks like the fins on a fish, or even a prehistoric dinosaur. Actually, Multitoff data is sometimes affectionately called a dimetrodon pattern because of its resemblance to that particular dinosaur. There are two things I want to point out. Notice how the spacing between the major peaks is so regular? If you do the math, you will find that there are 72 Daltons between the peaks. Now that happens to be the molar mass of the acrylic acid monomer residual. So basically, with a Maldi-Toff setup, you can see the difference between polymer molecules with only a single degree of polymerization separating them. That's resolution you can't get from SEC. Amazingly enough, the resolution is even better than one mer. In fact, it's even better than one atom. If you zoom in far enough, you can actually see when a molecule has a carbon-13 atom in it. That's just crazy in my book. To conclude this section, I want to quickly point out the main differences between SEC and MULDI-TOF as molecular weight distribution measurement techniques. SEC is a relative measurement, requiring known standards of the same polymer to calibrate it with, and it offers relatively poor resolution compared to MULDI-TOF, although no one complains about it. The resolution SEC offers works well the majority of the time. On the other hand, Maldi-Toff is an absolute method with an exceptionally high resolution, as we discussed. However, Maldi-Toff has been described as fussy since finding a usable matrix can be tricky. It is much easier to get proteins to fly than it is to get synthetic polymers to ionize. This is the big advantage of SEC, because it can handle any polymer, as long as you can dissolve it in something. In reality, there isn't a best option when it comes to getting a polymer molecular weight distribution. There are pros and cons for each. You just need to choose which is best for your particular situation.